All right, welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of columns in reinforced concrete design. And more specifically, um, we're going to be getting into the consideration of columns that are subjected to both axial load and moment at the same time, all right? And there's this unique interaction that occurs between those three, and we'll, we'll set up some methodologies for dealing with, with this. It'll look very much like the Whitney stress box that we look back at beams, but if we understand the stress on a cross-section, then we can very easily start to create these diagrams. Now, we're going to start off by looking at something known as an interaction diagram first, and then we'll move into like specific states within that interaction diagram. So this first video will be about kind of the, the the overall view of what we're looking at and then we'll get more specific as we move forward from here in the subsequent lessons so without further ado we'll get going all right so we're looking at um interaction diagrams for rc columns okay and basically the, the thought is, is that the analysis of a centrically loaded column shows that the behavior and strength calculations are rather complex with increasing eccentricity um, we're going to use a variable E that represents our eccentricity. And what we're looking at is for a column, if I draw just a quick sketch of it, we know that if I have a point load that is acting at this point on there, that would be concentric. Okay, But if I take this and I instead move it more out to here, and I call this as the eccentricity on this, this, that distance E, and of course you would have the one matching it on the bottom, and we've got to assume that there's something for that load to be acting on, of course, to get into, into our effect, that as E increases, that load that's acting here puts more and more moment into this beam, and it starts to become more like a beam than it does an actual column. All right, and so what we're trying to look at is the behavior, the combined effects of axial plus flexural on this and that's the premise because every column in a, in a real world building pretty much is guaranteed to have some sort of moment in it in addition to the axial load that it's holding up and it could have multiple moments which would make it you know a biaxial bending kind of case and we'll talk about that in a later video as well but for now we're going to define a couple of simple points on this okay um and we've kind of made a table to kind of define all of this all right and so the idea is is that if we have this set of information if I have an eccentricity, an E value of zero, okay, and again, if we look back at our picture, we're saying that E of zero means that this load is concentric with the column, then the load that we're going to calculate is our nominal axial load is that P-naught value that we talked about in the last video, and we'll, we'll bring that back around here in a couple minutes, um, how we calculate that particular value. And then for that, for this first case, MN is equal to zero. This is what we call the pure axially loaded situation all right now there is a special point on this curve that we'll show you that's called as a balance point and we'll show you how to calculate that that at this point our nominal load has a special axial value and our nominal moment has a special moment value okay and this is called as a balance condition all right and this will be the point at which the steel yields and the compression fail at the exact same instant all right and you, you've seen that before in flexure when we were talking about rho you know the reinforcement ratio and the balance reinforcement ratio so you've kind of seen that before okay and then the other extreme then is case five where e is infinity so again this load has moved all the way out to here it's a pure flexure problem the axial load has very little influence on this compared to the moment and so then the mn becomes equal to m naught and this is the pure bending case and then there are a couple other points that are kind of in between that are kind of not real specific on where they're located but just kind of give a general sense of the type of there and i'll point those out on the next page when we sh actually show you what all these relationships look like okay now so we've got those let's take a look at kind of what happens when i start to put all those parts together Get that out of the way okay and so this is kind of what an interaction diagram looks like and so what i've done is i've pulled in a picture here and tried to show you kind of the state of strain um, for this particular diagram. All right, so what we've plotted here is I have my axial load on this axis, and I have my nominal moment on this axis, and my capacity curve that identify those five points is these guys. So this was point one, this would be point three, and this would be the fifth point. Okay, so this is my pure axial, this is my balance, and this is my nominal moment. Okay, and so what we look at, as we start to look at that, and then the other two were, was a point that's arbitrarily between 1 and 3, and the other one was a point between 3 and 5. 
Okay, on this line, this indicates that it's a compression failure, that we're not yielding the steel. Okay, that it becomes more of, a, of an axial, you know, compression type member. And down here is more of a flexural member, you know, in which the steel yields, okay, that we, and that we're able to reach an ultimate moment capacity like we've always thought about being able to do. All right, so the, what we want to kind of show is kind of show what happens to the stress diagram. When it's pure axial, the strain diagram looks like this on, a cross, on the cross section. So, you know, if we imagine that we're going to draw, you know, our cross section on this, and then the corresponding strain for this, for the pure axial case, you know, would be something that looks like that, right? And now, for our column, columns typically have steel on at least two faces and sometimes more, depending on how it lines up. This picture still represents the same scenario. So what happens is, is that the load, when it's pushing in a pure axial case, is located concentrically at the middle. I get a uniform strain at all points in the cross section that is uniform. Okay, and so then as we get to the scenario where we get to a balance point on here, then just like we had with the flexure balance case, we reach epsilon CU at the exact same instance we get to epsilon Y here. And you'll notice it has a unique point in that this is the maximum moment location, this balance. It doesn't ever get any higher than that. But the axial, uh, the axial load case can go significantly higher, but the, I think I said axial moment, but the, uh, the moment is the highest value here. Okay, so we want to kind of figure out where we're at. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that I want to design for this. It kind of depends on, well, do I have more axial load than I do flexural load, and so forth and so on. Okay, so we're going to kind of show you kind of how to construct these diagrams here as we work through this packet. Okay, but that's the definition of our, our balance case, and that was this guy. And again, it's all for the same cross section. It's just a different state of strain for it. Okay, and then the M naught then is the case where epsilon S, um, where we get into a pure bending scenario, okay? And our epsilon S is much, much, much greater than epsilon Y, and we can go through and do some things with that. And again, I'll show you how to calculate those. All right, now what happens in here is, is that from this point zero out to the points on this curve, we have a series of lines, okay? And so what happens is, is that we know, nominally speaking, that a moment is equal to P times E, all right? And so if this is the balance, then I can put B subscripts on all of those pieces, and so that there is a relationship, and that comes from, you know, relocating the forces, if you will. If I have, you know, a moment that looks like this, you know, where I have an M and a P, I can replace that with a single P load it's measured at some distance, E. And by moving this force out, this concentrated moment, I can replace this with an equivalent single force system on those. So this is a little bit of statics review as we start to kind of look at, at that behavior. So, so that's kind of where we're going, and that's what all these represent. Well, the E lines are the ones that go from zero to the various points. All right, so E of zero is the vertical line. I'll pull this down here a little bit so you can see. Okay, and E of infinity is the horizontal line. Okay, and then this balanced E is the one that gets me imbalanced and p-balanced, you know, for a given um, axial load value. Okay, and so that's EB. So what we can do is we can now, if I can figure out what EB is, then I know that zero was here and balance was here. So let's just say that this guy was eight inches. You know, the balance was eight inches and this was zero. If I can figure out that my eccentricity is four inches, I know I'm up here somewhere. Okay, and that that is a compressive failure state you know, in the concrete, that it's more of a column than it is in a beam, and that becomes one of the checks that we can do for it. And likewise, if we go beyond that and say E is 100 or something, that puts us down here somewhere, and now I'm into a tensile failure state, and it's acting more like a beam than it is in a column. But there's this play that exists for an axial load and a moment that is defined by the shape of this curve. Now, every reinforcement in a cross-section, every reinforcement arrangement changes this curve. And so we'll show you some design aids, you know, in a later video of how we can kind of start to work with this stuff. But it's kind of an interesting idea. It's kind of a map of all the possible outcomes in the life of a reinforced concrete beam. So I find it kind of interesting. But this is the point that matters, that balance condition. We've got to have it because that sets our reference, just like what we did with the flexure problems, you know, a few videos back. Okay. Right. So we can go through, let's flip over to this. Now let's talk about how we can kind of determine the values of those points. Okay, so kind of what we talked about in the last video, the maximum strength in axial compression 
is that um, can, can kind of be summarized as follows. Since a truly concentrically loaded column is rare, if non-existent, some minimal eccentricity should be provided for. The accidental eccentricity may occur due to in conditions, inaccuracy of manufacture, or variation in materials even when the load is theoretically concentric. Okay, basically it's saying that for any column that's built, there has to be a minimum eccentricity applied. Now, back in the day, it used to be 5% of the smallest dimension, okay, for a tide column and, or for a spiral column, and then for a tide column, it was 10% of that, of that dimension, depending on the bending axis. So it was a pretty significant, because, you know, when you put up a set of forms for a reinforced concrete column, maybe they're not perfectly vertical, maybe they're slanted a little bit, there is some eccentricity in there. Different codes require different different amounts and you know the ASCE 7 you know in the minimum design loads document even talks about a minimum eccentricity in there that we should be considering okay so um, what happens is is that you know since 1977 the ACO I, I code has prescribed and this is section 22.4.2.1 that for members where slenderness may be neglected the maximum axial load the nominal strength if you will may not exceed 0 0.8 p naught for tie columns and 0.85 p naught for spiral columns. This was what we talked about in the last video, that tied columns are treated differently than spiral columns. Now, from the, the, the current ACI code, this is the table where all that starts to show up. So you can see that for non-pre-stress, and we have ties, it's 0.8 p naught. And for spirals, it's 0.85 p naught. That's where it's coming. Now, if you get into pre-stressing, things are those two values are still the same, but there are some other considerations that come along with pre-stressing with regard to the moment that you would have to also uh, and can, can, uh, conclude. And then if you have a composite structure, whether it's a steel core or a steel jacketed column, then it's just 0.85 p naught. It gets treated kind of like a spiral. Okay, so once you have this, you pick off the one that you want for the coefficient, and then you can come in and you can calculate the actual p naught value. And this is the formula I gave you guys last time. It's 0.85 f prime c times the gross area minus the area of steel plus the fy of the column multiplied by the area of the steel. Okay, and so again, if you're, if you're not understanding this formula, take a look at our last video and we can help you out with that as well. Okay? All right.